这一次的苹果发布会，我们在 Apple Park 采访到了苹果芯片背后的男人啊，苹果的硬件技术高级副总裁 Johnny s r o g i 他负责领导了从苹果的第一颗芯片 A 4一直到今天 A 1 8的研发、啊，是行业里公认的技术大牛。2020年，苹果划时代的 M1 就是由他亲自发布的，所以有一些同学可能已经很熟悉他了啊。那我们来看看他对于这一次的 A18 系列芯片和 iPhone 16系列的技术路径上的一些见解吧。Hi Johnny, I'm Yunfei from Jiko, and nice to have you here today. My pleasure. Good afternoon. My pleasure to meet you. So I heard you are kind of straightforward guy on tech topics. So maybe we can just step into the questions ASAP. Go ahead, please.、Yeah. So my first question is being obviously iPhone 16 and the iPhone 16 Pro series are probably the first iPhones after you launch the Apple Intelligence. So how do A18 and A18 Pro chips contribute to running Apple Intelligence? And for a wider perspective, has Apple Intelligence make any significant impact on your decision making when you are designing Apple Silicon's and maybe overall hardware? Yeah.、Uh, so you're referring to Apple Intelligence、uh, running on Apple Silicon for the iPhone, but we actually introduced and shipped our first neural engine implementation in 2017.、Yeah. And since then, we've been improving our neural engine year over year and adding more performance、uh, with power efficiency. And our colleagues from the software team has been leveraging and utilizing that engine. Then, when you look at Apple Intelligence running on Apple Silicon, it utilizes the whole SOC, but it heavily also utilizes the neural engine. Which we also added support for transformer models many years back, and that's one of the reasons that A17 Pro can support Apple Intelligence. So with A18 and A18 Pro, we took it even one step further. We kept improving the neural engine even more than A17 Pro. We added more bandwidth to the system memory, and we added more improvements across the whole SOC to build a balanced compute memory subsystem, including the capacity and the bandwidth and the compute. So. We built it from the ground up with Apple Intelligence in mind. You actually upgraded to 8 gigs of RAM on iPhone 15 Pro last year. If I'm not mistaken, the iPhone 16 series are also, you know, having the upgrade for 8 gigs of RAM, which for me seems like a, you know, critical turning point. So, could you explain the necessity of, you know, bringing more RAMs to iPhone? Is this decision solely driven by Apple intelligence, or were other use cases such as gaming also considered? So again, our goal is to build the best products, delivering the absolute best user experience. As it relates to Apple Intelligence, DRAM is one aspect. And when we look at what we're building, whether it's silicon hardware or software, we don't want to be wasteful in many ways. We have lots of data that tells us what is going to enable a certain feature, and Apple Intelligence is one of those very, very important features that we want to enable. And we look at different configurations,、uh, both for computation and memory bandwidth and memory capacity. And then we made the right trade-off and balance of what actually makes the most sense. So Apple Intelligence was a major feature that led us to believe that we we, we need to get to eight gigabyte. But having said that, the eight gigabyte is going to help immensely in many other applications, including gaming,、uh, high-end gaming, AAA title games, and high-end gaming on device. So I think it's going to be really, really beneficial. The other thing to keep in mind:、uh, this is one of the benefits of having the software and the silicon and the product fully integrated. Is that the software team, our excellent software team, will optimize not only for compute, they'll also optimize for the memory footprint of each application. So they don't en- end up also wasting memory. So we look at all these trade-offs and we end up with here is what makes sense, and 8 gigabyte was the most perfect、uh, choice for us. I think will be a harsh question. You know, some of your competitors are having started to put more core counts into their CPU designs. Even the latest、uh, Apple M4 chip has also increased the number of core counts compared to before. And in contrast, the A18 series continued to use, let's say, two performance cores and four efficiency cores. It's a strategy that you have been、uh, used for quite some times.、So、why did the Apple M4 consider increasing the numbers of core counts while A18 Pro? Didn't. Great question. So maybe I will start with our philosophy, and then I'll get to your、uh, to answer specifically your question. Our philosophy. I'll, I'll give you some、uh, some principles. One of the principles is we want to build、uh, the same CPU architecture, whether it's for a chip that goes into the phone or the iPad or the Mac or other、uh, configurations. So it's a scalable architecture. Same applies to the graphics and neural engine and others. 
Now, one of the main benefits for that is for the software and developers. You have a single architecture that you develop for the iPhone or the iPad or the Mac. So that's big. And by the way, another side benefit is from a team efficiency, you get to design one architecture. So that's one principle, same architecture across different chips. The second principle is given we're not a merchant vendor, we don't really need to target a specific peak performance for a specific corner case benchmark that you may not even experience or hit as a customer just in order to win some benchmark. We care about, again, delivering the absolute best user experience and for that, we look at lots of lots of data of how the devices, the software is using the silicon and what makes the absolute best use. And therefore, we make that data based on that aspect. A third principle, which is important, is you want to deliver the absolute best performance, whether it's a CPU or graphics, but let's talk about CPU since that's your question, with the highest performance at the best absolute energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, extremely, extremely important for us. So the best single thread, and that's key, because what others might be doing, other vendors, what they might be doing is they add multiple cores, more and more cores, in order to compensate for not so good single thread performance. So one way to compensate is you add more cores, uh, and therefore you can achieve a certain peak performance at higher power, larger die, which means also larger cost. So we don't do that either. So now let me answer your question based on these principles. When you look at the single thread of performance core across all of our silicon, it's the absolute best in the industry. We're leading the industry. If you look at the efficiency cores, same. We are the absolute best. We're like leading uh, in a big way. And then when we look at the configuration, whether it's a silicon that goes into the phone or the iPad or the Mac, uh, we have lots of simulation uh, and performance modeling tools, and we look at actual data. And then we take into account, for example, the battery size for a product, the power delivery system for a product, the thermal envelope for the product, because overbuilding, again, is wasteful. For example, for the phone, we came to the conclusion that two P4E, so two performance cores for efficiency cores, meets the needs of what that device requires, because we have the absolute best single thread, and the efficiency cores is so good for other tasks, and that configuration works. Then your next question was, why did you make different choice for M4 that goes into the iPad? Those have larger thermal envelopes, different power delivery, and therefore you can push the frequency and the performance to a different point. So going to my first principle of using the same architecture across different chips, we make the differentiation in implementation of frequency points, operating points. We enable peak frequency in order to enable what we call burst performance to give you the absolute best performance, but we also look into energy efficiency and where the sustained needs to be. And what is the shape of the curve when you look at power performance uh, so that your high performance, maximum energy efficiency. Okay, so the next question is about the microarchitecture. You actually have a long period of time that the microarchitecture of A-series CPUs was steadily updated for A16, I would say. Uh, starting with uh, A17 Pro, you actually started to uh, widen the, your CPU cores. Uh, we saw a nine-wide decode on A17 Pro, and depends on the CPU upgrade we saw on Apple M4, I would say we expect the A18-series CPU to widen further. So my question is, when you are making those decisions on CPU microarchitectures, you know, how PPA trade-offs are made. So my answer actually follows the same principle that I just covered, which is you want to design the best CPU for a certain silicon that goes into a certain product. And we have lots of data and performance modeling to tell us what configuration makes the best use in terms of highest power efficiency and performance. And obviously, we're not going to get into microarchitecture details on what plans we have in mind, but you can imagine we have a deep line of CPU microarchitecture, not for this year, next year, for many years to come. And we have modeling tools, including what cache sizes you need for each of these cores per implementation. Based on that, we make those decisions and based on what's gonna deliver the best user experience. Again, not for a certain benchmark. Now, in my experience, it proved to be the case that once you do that, you actually end up winning lots of benchmarks and winning those while keeping your energy efficiency. So it becomes a side benefit. But again, the strength that we have being an integrated part of Apple 
the full integration of the software, the product team, and the silicon team, where you design absolutely for what our product needs, not for everyone else, gives us the freedom to optimize what you call PPA, power performance area, for the absolute best energy efficiency and area. It's science, but it's science combined with art. And you make the proper judgment calls based on tools and modeling of what actually gonna deliver the best user experience. So it's both. Okay, so next question is about uh, gaming on iPhones. We saw developers bringing more and more AAA games to iPhone, but uh, obviously there are many inherent differences between mobile GPUs and desktop or console GPUs. Let's say typically mobile memory subsystem would be, you know, have much lower bandwidth. Mobile GPU rendering pipeline actually differs. Uh, for example, Apple's GPU are actually utilizing a tile-based deferred rendering techniques instead of immediate rendering. And also software development pipelines are quite, you know, distinct. So I'm wondering what engineering challenges did you guys face when deciding to port these AAA games to iPhone and how were they addressed? And by the way, again, uh, following one of the principles I just covered, which is we want to build the same GPU architecture for all of our chips. For yeah. example, you can see that the GPU architecture fundamentally that we built for the Mac and for the iPhone are very similar. The implementation are different, and we can get to that later, but the architecture is similar. And what that gives again to developers is they get to port or implement a game for the iPhone and the Mac, and it's the same porting, so that's great. And the fact that our GPU is so performing, that means that, for example, when you look at the phone, including 18 and 18 Pro, is that it has longevity, meaning you can, looking forward, for future games, it will be able to support those at really high performance, low power. Then when you look at different implementations, whether it's a phone or a Mac, this is where we make implementation differences. And we're smart about how we do that during the implementation while keeping the architecture similar. And it's not only frequency and operating points, it's below that even, meaning a lower level of details. But in terms of the functional architecture is, is the same. Of course, you're working with different power delivery and thermal envelopes, which is why you can see that Apple Silicon shipping on a phone has different or less GPU cores than Apple Silicon shipping in a MacBook Pro. But the fundamental, what we call FSTP, the shaders, etc., are very, very similar. And then we operate at different points, again, to maintain energy efficiency. But the same great graphics you get all across. We just talked about the running games on iPhone, and also thermal management is a crucial factor for that. This year, you emphasized improvements on thermal management. So can you specifically talk about what changes you made for the thermal management, the iPhone 16 and the 16 Pro series? And could you talk through decision-making and also how does it differ from previous thermal systems? Again, we build products, and the idea is to deliver the best products. And it's not only about the peak performance for graphics at certain thermal envelope. And again, this is where my team and the product team work hand in hand ahead of time about what is the absolute best decision we can make at the product level. Of course, in terms of silicon, you want more thermals, you want bigger battery, but that has trade off on other aspects. So we need to manage that piece. And we highlighted in the event this morning about some of the many thermal improvements that were made into the iPhone 16 series. And that obviously benefits the Apple Silicon that is enabling those iPhones. But then you go back to the energy efficiency. The fact that we have the most energy efficient chips, it helps us. And again, when you don't chase peak performance at higher power and not so energy efficient versus sustained and bursty performance, you get to optimize for the overall system. Obviously, we can get a bit deeper into that. You, you guys already implemented, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, aluminum plate inside of the phone. Actually, in the industry, a lot of people are using, let's say, vapor chambers and other solutions. So when you are deciding new thermal solution, what kind of, let's say, mindset did you go through? What kind of factors do you consider? You know, again, the mindset is you want to deliver the best product, not necessarily one thing the best product optimized for the absolute best user experience. For example, you can deliver a better uh, thermal envelope if you have thicker devices, you use different materials. The example you gave is one more example, but that's one trade-off. 
we believe if you take it to the extreme, it doesn't actually benefit the product because it has implications on the form factor and the ID. So we take all considerations into account, including the materials and how thick you can allow that product, we want it thinner, how much space you give battery and other components, even the placement of components on the MLB make a difference. So it's very thoughtful, thorough process that takes into consideration many, many aspects, but the absolute number one priority is building for the absolute products, not just thermal, so that I can deliver a peak performance and saying I win this benchmark. We want to deliver the best absolute product and the energy efficiency focus we have all across enables all of this. And again, it's an optimization at the product level. Okay, so the last question, let's talk about uh, video shooting on iPhone now. So uh, obviously iPhone have very great human capability compared to competitors. What kind of roles did Apple Silicon's made in that kind of process? Well, maybe for example, A18 series inside uh, iPhone 16 and 16 Pro. Of course, this started many, many, many years back. Uh, we've been investing in our image silicon processor, which is the ISP. The same applies for other media engines. So we've been investing in that space. We believe we have the best absolute custom silicon that is built uh, for these devices. For example, if you look at each frame that passes through our camera ISP, it gets analyzed for things like color and tone. When you look at the image signal processing as a pipeline, it starts with a, an excellent image information that gets into the ISP, and then it gets refined even further by dedicated streaming machine learning based processing that have been trained on millions of photos before that. And those run on the neural engine. So you can see the tight integration between the neural engine and the ISP in this case. Now, the neural engine also provides detailed semantic information about the overall scene, including the subjects, various subjects, and the intent of the photographers. Now, what this does, it enables the camera to deliver a wider range of dynamic information based on the scene and the materials in the scene, etc. And we get to do that very, very fast at a high rate, 120 4K frames per second. So that's great. Then post ISP, as, as that gets processed, we have another media engine called the video encoder that compresses the video at 1 billion pixels per second. So when you combine both, you get to a very high rate. That's how we enable Dolby Vision 4K 120 frames per second. Uh, sometimes you can see that others, you know, our competitors, can generate through lots of software processing a good frame, a good picture at one time. But we're first in terms of delivering a video for Dolby Vision video 4K 120 capture. Um, and that's thanks to the tight integration of the silicon, different IPs, and the software, and the camera control. It's like the physics, camera control, and the silicon, including the ISP, they all work together. I think that's all the questions we have today, so thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you.